Who then is this who even the wind and the sea obey? The end of chapter 4 of Mark provokes the key question. They're following Jesus, sure, but who is it that they're following? Have we gotten into more than we bargained for? They may well be wondering at this point. One thing you no doubt observed in listening to the Gospel of Mark thus far is Mark is a man of action. It's one thing after another, uh, one scene after another. He doesn't waste much time. Every Gospel writer really has their own style. And the immediate jumping around from scene to scene is very characteristic of Mark's style in particular. So, having talked about the last verse briefly, we're actually going to go over to the first verse, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ. This phrase is so familiar to us that the degree to which it was utterly shocking in the context of the time is lost on us completely. This verse was an immediate challenge to the allegiances of his Roman audience. It was a challenge in which Mark brought up, who is it that you should follow? What kind of salvation should you seek? Good news was a term that had a meaning, and the meaning was with reference to the good tidings brought by the Roman emperor. I included on the handout uh, an example of this from 9 BC. So this is an inscription found on a monument in what is now Western Turkey. Since Providence has set in most perfect order by giving us Augustus, sending him as a savior, the birthday of the god Augustus was the beginning of the good news for the world that came by reason of him. Like I said, it's really easy to blow past this. We've been using the term gospel as kind of a generic thing for so long that the shocking nature of verse 1 is, again, lost to us. But it was shocking. Now, the audience, in a sense, was primed for this because no matter what earthly benefits a Roman emperor was prepared to bequeath, no Roman emperor was prepared to promise eternal life as Jesus Christ was. But immediately, the reader of the Gospel of Mark is told, if you seek to follow Christ, if you seek to embrace his good news, you need to put aside any other good news you might be following. If eternal life is what you seek, it needs to be your first and foremost priority over all else, even the government. That's just verse 1. Uh, so what happens next? We've got the, the preaching of John the Baptist. And John the Baptist... Uh, Sounds like quite a character here. Mark describes him very vividly. Uh, some kind of insane individual is the way Mark is portraying him. But he says, I have baptized you with water. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. You know, the John the Baptist is emphasizing he's a messenger. Someone greater than me is coming who will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Water in and of itself is not salvific. And so at that point we have to ponder what does it even mean for Jesus to be baptized? 
He doesn't have anything to repent of. So, St. Ambrose, one of the fathers of the church and a mentor for St. Augustine in particular, addressed this directly, saying, and I included this quote for you all as well, the Lord was baptized not to be cleansed himself, but to cleanse the waters, so that those waters cleansed by the flesh of Christ, who knew no sin, might have the power of baptism. Whoever comes to the washing of Christ lays aside his sins. So the meaning of the baptism of Jesus is that he is making water capable of sending the Holy Spirit into everyone who is baptized for the forgiveness of their sins. So baptism is not merely some kind of uh, routine or what have you. Baptism is an actual affecting of forgiveness of sins because of what Jesus Christ did in his own baptism. Now this is immediately followed by the temptation of Jesus. And if you haven't ever sat down and read Mark before, you might have been a little surprised at the brevity of the account. Stones, bread, going up on temples, all that stuff, that's Matthew and Luke. And we'll visit those another time. But Mark's account, while brief, is poignant. He remained in the desert for 40 days, tempted by Satan. He was among wild beasts. What's the implication here? The implication is that he was among animals who were prepared to kill him. That's what wild beasts signifies. Angels ministered to him. In his humanity, Jesus humbly accepts the assistance, the intercession of angels for the sake of uh, enduring those temptations. So we see here a glimpse of the true humanity of Jesus Christ. He never sinned, but he experienced temptation, without a doubt. And that experience of temptation, the experience all of us have, is something that he viscerally understands. In moments where we ourselves experience temptation, we can know that Jesus Christ walks with us in those moments, just as he walked in the desert experiencing temptation, experiencing fear from both the animals and the climate. And he resorted to prayer to get past this temptation. And so, in this moment, this temptation of Jesus, he gives us a model for dealing with temptation in the fullness of his humanity. Now, there's in a sense a prize that he won in overcoming this temptation. What is that prize? It established that the spirits of the netherworld were subject to him. Having passed through being tempted by Satan, but being ministered to by the angels, he was now prepared to banish the influence of Satan anywhere he encountered it. And in this narrative we have from Mark, he seems to encounter it an awful lot. It's often interesting to think about this, because at some point or another, I'm sure you have encountered those who seek to 
for lack of a better phrase, demystify the Gospels. Casting out demons while he was just like healing mentally ill people or, or something. But I'm going to suggest that we actually need to take the scriptures very, very seriously here. If Jesus was subject to temptation by the devil, and the devil is manifesting himself in a myriad of ways for the sake of luring people into sin, Jesus, by his very presence, banishes that source of temptation when it arrives. So, the fact that demons were manifesting ever more clearly in his presence is in fact a sign that they knew their time was up. In general, in the spiritual life, demonic influence tends to be subtle rather than manifest. But in the presence of Jesus, they know their time is up, and he's there to cast them out and put them aside. If we look now at 122, The Sabbath, he entered the synagogue and taught. Uh, there was a man with an unclean spirit. You know, you, you see a phrase like unclean spirit, and the term unclean is maybe a little sanitized compared to what we have in the underlying Greek. It does have the idea of unclean, but it also has the idea of stark, primitive evil. Jesus of Nazareth, have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Jesus rebuked him and said, Quiet, come out of him. And here Mark juxtaposes both his authority over demons as well as the authority he evidences in his teaching and his preaching. Jesus is the total package. He teaches with divine authority, and he manifests that divine authority by casting forth all evil influence from his midst wherever he is located. So already we have the sign of the divine among us right here. But it's not long before this gets even clearer in the healing of the paralytic. One of the most striking scenes in all of literature they were so desperate for the healing of the paralytic that they climbed up the building and tore the roof off. Just think about that for the moment. You've got the crowd around the house. They are desperate to heal their friend. They find another way. I have to share an interesting story here. My grandmother had been away from the church for, for decades, and she was in a nursing home. And I visited her there, and I learned that she had been um, attending mass at the nursing home. A priest would come and offer mass, and, and she would attend it. And I knew she'd been away from the church for a long time, so I called the parish, and I said, you know, my grandmother's been, you know, receiving ministry from you all. She's been away from the church for a while, and she's also very near death. Could we arrange for her to receive the sacrament of the anointing of the sick? They said, sure, sure, we'll make that happen. I don't really remember the timing of how all of this worked out, but I do remember that in the last week of her life, when she was no longer lucid or conscious, uh, the priest did in fact come and give her the anointing of the sick. It was the last semester of working on my PhD when she passed away. And I did have a chance to speak to her on the phone before she died. 
And I was pondering a bit the sheer grace of the sacrament of the anointing of the sick. That after all those years and what we'll call an interesting life, she'd been reconciled to the church, you know? And I actually asked a priest, how is this? How is it that the anointing of the sick does this? And he said, consider the paralytic. Consider the friends that brought the paralytic there. It was the initiative of the friends. They brought him to Jesus. And that's what you did for your grandmother. Many years later, my then four or five-year-old son said, Dad, is purgatory like a ladder? I said, well, you, you, you could say that. Um, I didn't tell him at the time, but that's how Dante describes purgatory in the Divine Comedy. And he said, well, so, so, yeah, but why would you ask that? And he said, well, I had a dream. In the dream, I met your grandmother. And she said she was in purgatory. And I asked her what purgatory was, and she said, well, it's like a ladder. Obviously, I said a few extra prayers for her soul after that. But in this passage, Jesus doesn't begin with a physical healing. He begins with a spiritual healing. Child, your sins are forgiven. And then he says, why does he speak that way? He's blaspheming. Jesus says, what's easier, to say your sins are forgiven or to say rise, pick up your mat, and walk? But that you may know the Son of Man has authority to forgive sins on earth. I say to you, rise, pick up your mat, and go home. Now, notice that he does not contradict them. They say, who but God alone can forgive sins? And Jesus doesn't come around and say, well, you know, it's not reserved to God alone. I kind of as a bonus can do it. No, so that you know I have the authority to do it, rise. And in that moment, he is saying, God is walking among you. It's the divine Christ right there. So in the first two chapters, Mark has already given us both the human Christ, tempted in the wilderness, and the divine Christ, forgiving sins and healing the paralytic and casting out demons. Oh wait, there's more. So, 311. Whenever unclean spirits saw him, they would fall down before him and shout, You are the Son of God. He warned them sternly not to make him known. Why is that? We'll come back to that in a moment. But again, emphasizing his divinity, we get to this section about him being accused of being in league with the devil. And he says, No one can enter a strong man's house to plunder his property unless he first ties up the strong man. Then he can plunder his house. This is a parable, but he's claiming pretty clearly I am the strong man, I have tied him up, or I am the one tying up the strong man. I am now plundering his house. I am casting out the demons. Finally, in chapter 4, he woke up, rebuked the wind, and said to the sea, quiet, be still. That word, rebuke, is the same word he used when casting out demons. Just as demons directly were causes of trouble and he rebukes them with his authority, he so too rebukes the wind, the storm, which itself was a temptation for the disciples. I'm going to conclude this first talk by talking a little bit about the motif of secrecy. Jesus is trying to keep his status quiet to some degree. So for instance, with the cleansing of the leper, 
he says, don't tell anyone anything, just show yourself to the priest and get cleansed and all is good. And the man went away and began to publicize the whole matter. He spread the report abroad so that it was impossible for Jesus to enter a town openly. Jesus is quieting the spirits. Psst, don't say son of God. Go, deal with this quietly. Because his time hasn't really come yet for him to be fully manifest as son of God. He is certainly claiming it. He is certainly making no two ways about it. But he's not totally advertising it yet because he wants to be able to go about and interact with people without being necessarily totally mobbed. So I have a couple of reflection questions for you all. We'll take just a couple of minutes to give you time to reflect, then I'll start the next talk and keep things moving. Caesar was neither the first nor last earthly being to claim to bring good news and salvation. Now, in the 21st century, who or what do you see as others who are promising good news of a sort or salvation of a sort? Perhaps something secular, perhaps something else. And how do those claims compare to what Jesus has to offer? Secondly, Mark emphasizes both the full humanity and the full divinity of Jesus Christ. Think about your own journey and your own prayer life. How do you relate to these aspects of Jesus yourself? You might be more comfortable with thinking of Jesus as human or more comfortable with thinking of him as divine. How might you be more comfortable with the other aspect, the other nature of Jesus Christ? So I invite you to prayerfully contemplate these things for the next uh, few minutes, and then we'll uh, start the second talk.